the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Paul Martin, Washington Bureau Chief of the Gannett News Service. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Richard B. Russell, United States Senator from Georgia. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Senator Russell, our audience, of course, knows you as a distinguished Georgian who is now a principal contender for the Democratic nomination for the presidency. And tonight, we'll welcome some of your views, sir. Now, uh, how long have you been in the Senate, sir? I came to the Senate uh, January 13th, 1933. I've almost 20 years. I'm approaching... And now, Senator, years. our audience would like to know just where you stand in the political spectrum. Are, are you a new dealer, sir? Well, I call myself a middle-of-the-roader, Mr. Huey. Uh, one of my newspaper friends once labeled me as a 60% New Dealer during the administration of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now, are you a critic of the present administration? Well, I've criticized some of the things that this administration has done. I have supported, though, a great deal of the uh, legislative uh, it, requests of this administration. I believe, Senator, you said when you announced for the presidency that you were a Jeffersonian Democrat. Now. Uh, we haven't heard much about that lately. Can you tell us what a Jeffersonian Democrat well, is? Well, it's surprising to me that so few people apparently recall uh, what Jefferson stood for, his fundamental principles. Of course, he's the father of the Democratic Party. He and Andrew Jackson are our patron saints. Uh, Jefferson stood for the rights of the states as being protection of the rights of the individual <coughs> from encroachment by the federal power. He also stood for absolute incorruptibility in the administration of government. Well, Senator Russell, we haven't had much of what he stood for in the Democratic National Platform in the last 20 years, have we? Well, we've wandered rather far from the fundamental principles of Jefferson, but I think that there are millions of Democrats throughout the country that still adhere to the Jeffersonian uh, principles. I but think they live in every state of the Union. Now, sir, uh, in your 20 years, and incidentally, I believe you are one of the youngest men who is a candidate for the presidency now. You're only 54, aren't you? That's right. I'm and you, you've younger. been in Congress almost 20 years. That's, that's true, and served as governor of my state before that. Well, sir, now, uh, in general, did you support most of the legislation, most of the New Deal legislation under, under President Roosevelt? I, I think that the friend that estimated I supported 60% of it was about right. And, uh, I supported you very vigorously a uh, part of this program, the rural electrification program, uh, the farm program, and uh, by any, a large number of the measures that Mr. Roosevelt had. And the South has, has generally prospered under that, un, under that legislation, has it not? Yes, I think that the South has, uh, in, is, uh, the prosperity of the South has increased greatly in the last uh, 20 years. Well, on your definition of a Jeffersonian Democrat, uh, you'd have to have a considerable uh, revision of, say, the 1948 Democratic National Platform, or you couldn't uh, be an honest uh, exponent of the party for president. Well, there are some uh, features of the 1948 platform that uh, I think are contrary to Jeffersonian principles. Not all, though, not all of that uh, platform was. The Democratic Party has always been the party of the people and the party of uh, individual rights and liberties and the party that stood for the rights of the states. Well, now, in practice, let's take something in practice here. Uh, we've got a Democratic president in the White House, and we have had for, uh, for about 20 years. Now, uh, if you were president, Senator Russell, would you feel that you had the inherent powers under the Constitution that Mr. Truman says he has 
to seize the steel industry or the newspapers or radio stations or anything else. Well, Mr. Martin, I'm afraid of this matter of uh, inherent powers. Uh, this is a government of law and not a government of men. And where there is a statute that's been enacted by Congress that's available for use, it's highly preferable to use that statute rather than to relying on as nebulous a term as inherent powers. Of course, we must remember that if the power to seize the if radio or the press or in steel uh, plants, if that exists in the president, he also has a power to seize the labor unions. And the labor man would uh, feel rather alarmed to come in and find some major sitting in the, at the desk of the business agent or the secretary treasurer of the union. By that, you are telling our audience that you are somewhat disturbed by the president's action. I would much prefer for the president to have followed the statutes. I think there are at least two statutes that could have been employed to resolve this matter without resorting the inherent powers. And I greatly fear the precedent that's been set. I don't think Mr. Truman's any dictator, but I think that uh, his act could well be the blueprint for some man well, who might seize all of the powers of government uh, in the future. On the statute, you mean the uh, National Emergency Clause of the Taft-Hartley Act? Yes, either that or uh, a statute of which I happen to have been the author when the original draft bill passed, which gave the president the power to uh, uh, seize any plant or facility in this country that failed or refused to uh, supply uh, contracts that were necessary for the defense effort. I well, think it had been preferable to have employed either one of them. Both of them provide the standards of seizure, they provide for the method of repayment, and don't leave all of those matters up in the air as this, uh, matter, as this thing of uh, inherent powers does. Now, uh, Senator Russell, uh, this matter of inherent powers, you know, it's another southerner it's Tom Clark of Texas, uh, he used to be the Attorney General who ruled and told the President that he had inherent powers under the Constitution. And Tom Clark's now on the Supreme Court, which would be the court of last resort if anybody ever wanted to test this theory of inherent powers. Well, Mr. Martin, of course, uh, each lawyer, I th uh, suppose, thinks his opinion is the best. There have been a number of decisions which the majority of this present Supreme Court have handed down that did not jibe with my construction of the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> well, Senator, after all now, you are a, a very active candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency, and so rapidly we'd like some of your views on specific issues. Now, number one, about how many delegates do you expect to have at the convention in, in Chicago? Well, I hope to have uh, as many as 400, and I'm quite confident that I will have more than 300. And, and, and uh, I think that our audience is particularly interested, do you expect to have support from northern states? I will have some support from northern states, yes. Uh, I will have some delegates. However, the bulk of my support is uh, in the southern states. Now, but a delegate is a delegate, and one vote counts as much as the other. That matters as a practical politician, do you think that it is now possible for a southerner to receive the Democratic nomination for the president? Well, Mr. Huey, I don't like to think that after 90 years of uh, intervening, and the Democratic Party has loyally supported the uh, been loyally supported by the South over that period that uh, a man would be discriminated against because he happened to have been born on the wrong side of the tracks well, that the brings wrong us side of the Mason-Dixon line. That brings us to the principal question, sir, which you always ask, I'm sure, but our audience would like to hear your views on uh, the traditional policies as, as regards FEPC. Now, that, of course, is one of the things that uh, is objected, reasons that you're objected to in the northern cities, particularly. Just what is your view on FEPC? Well, Mr. Hewitt, the FEPC isn't any southern issue or sectional issue. It goes very to the very heart of our American system. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it, that uh, theory contemplates that the federal government has the power to pass upon employment and upon promotions and upon employment policies and uh, also in the matter of discharges from employment. Now, I do not believe the free enterprise system can possibly exist if uh, we had to have a horde of federal agents running all over the country, appearing over men's shoulders and undertaking to read their minds. Of course, after all, it is a matter of the thought, it's the thought police. What was in the man's mind when he hired this individual rather than the other, or, or even a group uh, rather than another group? I do not think, I think that that will eventually result in uh, the nationalization of all business and industry in this country if we ever pass a compulsory jail sentence, uh, <coughs> FEPC, that puts a man in prison because he employs one man instead of, a other, of, of another. Now, it's not a southern Russell, issue, it's an American issue. Uh, this is a very important issue, but uh, while we have time here, I'd like to discuss something about foreign policy. 
you're, you were the chairman of the joint uh, Senate Armed Services and Foreign Relations Committee that uh, conducted the hearings on President Truman's firing of General MacArthur That's last right. year. Well, you went into that very exhaustively. You well, had about, about seven weeks, words of testimony. About seven weeks, uh, morning and afternoon, and right. a few night sessions. Well, now, why didn't you ever get around to writing a report telling the American people how you felt about whether the president should or should not have fired General MacArthur? Well, I'll tell you about that. Every American citizen had made up his mind already. There was no reason there for that committee to sit down and squabble for three weeks in writing a report which would have been a divided report. It had been impossible for all of them to have agreed, and it would have just uh, added fuel uh, to the flames of bitterness that spread over the country on both sides of that issue. We, the committee couldn't restore General MacArthur to his command if we had held that the president had been in error in discharging him, and uh, there was no good that I saw that could flow from the committee undertaking by division to say whether General MacArthur was right or whether the Joint Chiefs were right or the President well, was Russell, correct in his views. It's been a great pleasure to have you with us tonight, and thank you very much, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to be on this program. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Paul Martin. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Richard B. Russell, United States Senator from Georgia. The progress of watchmaking over the years has been enormously stimulated by competitions between watchmakers arranged by some of the leading national observatories. You should know that a first prize won in an observatory accuracy contest is one of the highest honors to which a watch manufacturer can aspire. You should also know, if you are contemplating the purchase of a very fine watch, that the record of Longines in observatory accuracy competitions is unsurpassed. Year after year, since 1878, Longines watches have won first prize after first prize for chronometers, deck watches, pocket watches, and wrist watches. And of great interest to you, the present accuracy record for wrist watches at the great Neuchâtel Government Observatory is held by Longines, the world's most honored watch. If you wish to own just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, your choice might well be Longines, the world's most honored watch, winner of 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 Gold Medal Awards, and innumerable honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. This is David Ross. Speaking for your regular host, Frank Knight, inviting you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at the same time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whittenor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem, Agency for Longine Whitnor Watches. This coming Sunday, watch the Jack Benny Show on the CBS Television Network.